Okay, we're back. We are going to be doing some hypertrophy stuff today. Okay, so we're going to be looking at hypertrophy of the different chambers of the heart. So your atriums on both sides, as well as your ventricles on both sides. Okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about first uh, what hypertrophy really means. Okay, so we're going to go to the whiteboard here real quick. And This is clearly not an anatomically accurate drawing of the heart, but this is how I like to think of things, right? So if you had your right atrium over here, you would have your tricuspid valve right here, right? And then you would have your right ventricle over here. And then you're going to have your pulmonic artery, pulmonic vein. Then you would have your left atrium, bicuspid or mitral valve. And then you'd have your left ventricle and then your aortic valve. And then here you would have your pulmonic valve, right? So that's kind of like how everything works here. So, um, well, what is hypertrophy? It's the growing of a muscle, right? The expanding in size of a muscle, usually due to excessive workload or excess strain. So if you go to the gym and you do bicep curls every day, what's going to happen? Your biceps are going to hypertrophy because they're accommodating to the extra strain that's being placed upon them, okay? Well, your heart is a muscle as well, just like they are. So when the heart is faced with greater workloads, the muscle of the heart is going to accommodate that greater workload by increasing in size. And we call that hypertrophy. Now in the very beginning, that's fine. It's adapting and accommodating to things. Uh, however, um, once you hypertrophy past a certain point, um, it, it starts to become problematic. And let's also remember to differentiate between uh, natural physiologic hypertrophy from like somebody who say an athlete, for example, uh, and pathologic hypertrophy, okay? Because they are a little different. It's different having a bigger heart because you are a Tour de France cyclist versus somebody who's had uncontrolled hypertension for 35 years, right? So they're not the same thing, okay? So let's just look at what we got here. If we had excess workload on the left ventricle from like let's say increased afterload like a person who has uncontrolled hypertension right when this aortic valve opens right here the heart is going to need specifically the left ventricle is going to need to pump against a greater workload so who is going to have to do more work most likely the left ventricle okay to accommodate for that extra workload so what's going to happen to the left ventricle over time it's going to get bigger. It's going to hypertrophy. Okay. So let's use a different scenario, right? Let's say a person has uh, mitral valve stenosis. Let's say they have mitral valve stenosis. Well, if that mitral valve is stenotic and it's narrowed, right? Pressure is going to kind of back up because things are having trouble getting through it. So where is pressure going to back up to if you have a stenotic mitral valve? It's going to back up to the left atrium because blood flow is trying to pass from the left atrium to the left ventricle through this stenotic mitral valve. And it's limiting the amount of, uh, I would say, blood that can get through. And the left atrium is going to accommodate by working harder to increase the pressure to get it through that uh, smaller opening. It's like trying to have a regular straw versus a coffee stirrer and trying to blow through it, right? So a person that has, let's say, mitral valve stenosis, for example, the problem isn't down here, right? Because the left ventricle doesn't care. The problem is going to be more over here in the left atrium because that increased workload over time. So in that particular person, you might end up with left atrial enlargement, okay? So you have to think about what the problem is and then where things are coming from 
and how the problem can affect where things are coming from, okay? So for example, if I had uh, aortic valve stenosis, I might have maybe left ventricular hypertrophy. If I have mitral valve stenosis, I might have left atrial enlargement, okay? They don't really call it left atrial hypertrophy, even though that's what it is, but they just call it left atrial enlargement. So you're gonna see when we talk about ventricles, for whatever reason, they're gonna say ventricles are hypertrophied. So you'd say left ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy. But the atriums, we don't really use that term. Some people do, but it's much more common to hear like right atrial enlargement or left atrial enlargement, okay? It's a more common term. So what if we had some sort of um, pulmonary pathology, right? Let's say you got COPD, you've got core pulmonal, right? And now you have increased pressure somewhere in that area. Pulmonic arteries are increased in pressure, right? So if this right ventricle has to pump against increased pressures and increased workloads in the pulmonary arteries, what's the right ventricle gonna do to accommodate that increased workload? It's gonna hypertrophy, right? So in a case of like, usually like pulmonary things or maybe like a, a pulmonary artery hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, or maybe like a pulmonary valve stenosis, things like that, uh, you're gonna see uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, okay? And then of course, what if you had maybe a problem in, um, the tricuspid valve. So what if we had tricuspid valve stenosis, right? Well, the right atrium is gonna to have to work harder to pump blood through that stenotic uh, right tricuspid valve. So the right atrium would eventually enlarge to accommodate that increased workload, okay? And it's totally possible to have uh, a ventricular and an atrial hypertrophy enlargement together. So. You can absolutely have left ventricular hypertrophy and uh, left atrial enlargement, okay? Or you can have both atria enlarged. They call that biatrial enlargement. So you could have left atrial enlargement and right atrial enlargement, okay? So these are just things to kind of kind of keep in the back of your mind, you know? So uh, like, why does all this matter, you know? Uh, well, it matters for lots of reasons. As left ventricular hypertrophy gets out of hand, uh, you're going to see a reduction in contractility of the left ventricle. Uh, so you can have a person that has congestive heart failure that's never had a heart attack in their life. They've just had uncontrolled hypertension for 35 years. Now they have this giant uh, left ventricle and it has lost contractility because of it. And if you lose contractility, you got to remember cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume comes from contractility. And of course your blood pressure equals your cardiac output times your systemic vascular resistance, right? So you can see where that becomes problematic. And a lot of people will look at uh, an EKG, determine, okay, what's the rhythm? It's not a STEMI, okay, good, right? But you gotta look at the subtleties. You wanna look for left atrial enlargement. You wanna look for right atrial enlargement, especially depending on your clinical practice. If you get a 55 year old male uh, that comes in and you know he's got like a new onset of like impotence, for example, and he wants uh, like an erectile dysfunction drug and he's asking for something like Viagra or whatever the case may be, you know, you might wanna investigate the heart. It might be prudent to make sure that uh, we give or we, we, we do a cardiac workup on this guy, see what's going on. So you might see a guy that maybe has left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement. Maybe he's got mitral valve stenosis, right? He's got a bunch of things and you might think like, well, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure this medication is necessarily safe for this guy now, right? I'm not saying it is or it isn't, um, but you just want to investigate these things. You just don't want them to slip, slip past you because remember, you miss every diagnosis that you don't think of, right? So, all right, so that's my uh, speech on hypertrophies for the most part. Okay, cool. So where do we go from here? Just like a lot of other things that we have been doing, you're just gonna have to learn the criteria for things, okay? Because that's just what it comes down to, all right? So once again, as I always try to do for you guys, uh, we will make it as simple as possible. Um, 
just a quick note here. If you go to slide 48 on, let me see where we at. Where is my right atrial enlargement? Ah, here we go. Slide 49. So I'm going to start with the atriums first. I know the order of the PowerPoint goes ventricles and then atriums, but like, I just, I like to think of things in a, in a linear fashion, right? Blood goes to the atriums before it goes to the ventricles, right? So we're going to start with the atriums first. Uh, just a quick note here, guys. This says uh, three millimeters right here, right? It's really 2.5, okay? So it's really going to be uh, greater than or equal to 2.5 millimeters. That's more commonly used, all right? So one of the things I just want to point out for you guys is that you're going to learn, need to learn the criteria for your diagnosing of left atrial, right atrial enlargement, left ventricular, right ventricular hypertrophy. There is, in some of instances, different criteria for things. So if you go and investigate into left ventricular hypertrophy, you will see that there is a whole bunch of different criteria that are out there, okay? Uh, the most commonly appro accepted approach is kind of like a... Uh, amalgamation or a um, they take a bunch of criteria for different things and they kind of put them all together to make it work. So that's kind of what we're going to do because there's diagnostic criteria. There's uh, there's just a lot of different stuff. So the most commonly used one is the Sokolaw Leone method, um, which is kind of what one of the things we're going to teach you is. So let's before we get into the, the ventricular stuff, let's just talk talk about the um, the atrial stuff. Okay, so Here's really what it comes down to. You got to know where to look and what to look for, right? Just like in bundle branch blocks or axis deviation, you know, where do we look for axis deviation? We'll look lead one, AVF, right? And then we got to know what to look for. Just like bundle branch blocks, we got to know where to look, V1, lead one, V6, and what to look for, okay? Same thing with atrial enlargements and ventricular hypertrophies. You just got to know where to look first. And then once you know and trained your eyes where to look, then you just got to see what to look for. Okay. So that's what we're doing here. So what we're going to be doing for our atrial enlargements, right and left, two leads we're going to look at. We're going to look at lead two and V1. Those are going to be our money leads for atrial enlargements, left and right, okay? So what we're doing here is we're looking at the P waves. So when I'm looking for atrial enlargement, I'm looking at the P waves in lead two and the P waves in V1. It's common to have a normal, nice, pretty P wave in lead two. And it's common in V1 because V1 is a kind of a negative deflection lead by its, by its, um, physiology. It's just how it looks. Okay. So it's common to have what they call a biphasic P wave in a normal EKG in V1. And what do we mean by biphasic? Well, bi means two and it goes up a little bit and then it goes down a little bit and that's just how it looks. Okay. So the up part should be generally speaking equal to the down part or maybe even a little bit more. That's kind of the normal presentation. So let's do uh, right atrial enlargement first, starting in chronological order of how things go through the heart. So I, for right atrial enlargement, am not even looking at V1. I'm not even looking at it. I don't even care. You don't exist to me, right? I'm just looking at lead two, okay? So I'm looking at lead two, and I'm looking at the P waves, and I want to see, is it greater than or equal to 2.5 millimeters in height, okay, in height. So just to kind of like put things in perspective for you guys, right? We're measuring amplitude on an EKG. right? Because up and down measure amplitude, which is a measurement of electricity. So it just kind of goes to, to think when you think about it, like it just makes sense that if a muscle is bigger because it has hypertrophied, 
it's going to use more electricity because it's bigger. And if it uses more electricity, we're going to get a greater height or greater amplitude on the EKG. So that's kind of why things get bigger when we get hypertrophies. P waves get bigger and R waves get bigger, right? Okay. And why are we looking at the P waves for the atriums? Well, because that's where they come from. Why are we looking at the R waves and the QRSs for ventricular hypertrophy? Because, well, that's where they come from, the ventricles, right? All right. Back to business. So right atrial enlargement greater than 2.5 millimeters in height and amplitude, not, not time, height. So right atrial enlargement, if you got some P waves that are bigger than 2.5 millimeters in height in lead to, you've got right atrial enlargement. That's it. Simple. There's no more to it than that. So right atrial enlargement should be very easy to identify, right? Because if you got a guy that's got like a P wave over here, right? And then you got a guy over here that's got like P wave like that. And you're like, hey, man, you got some big old P waves, man. That's a big P wave right there. And you measure it out and it's greater than 2.5 millimeters in height. You got right atrial enlargement. Okay, that's it. Now, let's do left atrial enlargement. Typically a little bit more worrisome um, because left atrial enlargement, not always, but um, can be indicative of problems with the mitral valve and things like that. And um, so a little, little bit more worrisome sometimes, but not terribly so. So uh, we got to look at two leads for left atrial enlargement, right? Lead two, V1, we're doing, lead two and V1 is all we're looking at for our atrial enlargement stuff, okay? So first thing we're gonna look at is lead two. And this should be greater than, this is a P wave. These are all P waves, mind you. Greater than 0.12 seconds. If your P wave is greater than 2.2, I'm sorry, if your P wave is greater than 1.2 seconds in duration, not height, but like time, and then you go to V1, and this bottom half down here is one of two things. Either the negative deflection is greater than the positive deflection, or sometimes you don't have a biphasic P wave like that. You just have a upside down P wave like that. So it's one of two things. Either the, the net negative of your P wave in V1 is a net negative in that it goes down more than it goes up, right? That is one of the criteria. Or the negative part of the P wave in V1 is greater than one millimeter going downwards, okay? So you've got a two, two basic things to look for here in V1. And let's just make it simple. Does it go down more than it goes up? If so, yes, left atrial enlargement. If it goes down and it doesn't really go up, but it goes down more than one millimeter, we're talking about V1 here, then we have left atrial enlargement. So either a net biphasic, I'm sorry, net negative, or it goes down greater than one millimeter. That's a greater than symbol, not a seven alligator. Okay, um, so left atrial enlargement, gotta look for two things. Gotta look at lead two, V1. They gotta both be there, right? 
So if lead two has P waves that are wider than 0.12 seconds, I go to V1, I look at the P wave, if it's a net negative deflection or it's going down more than one millimeter, we've got left atrial enlargement. So that's pretty much it for left atrial enlargement, okay? Oops. All right, so here's the thing. Let's look at the morphology of this. Sometimes you have an M-shaped P wave like that in left atrial enlargement. Or sometimes you don't, okay? So some people will say, oh, you look for an M-shaped P wave in left atrial enlargement. That is true. You might get a left atrial enlargement with an M-shaped P wave, but you also might not. So you don't rely on that. It's kind of like the rabbit ears for the right bundle branch block. You might get rabbit ears for right bundle branch block, but you also might not. So you can't just solely rely on that because some people will say, oh, I just look for the M-shaped P wave. Well, that's true. You should, but don't rely on that, okay? Because you might miss it otherwise. So right atrial enlargement, just to review, what's right atrial enlargement? We just look at lead to, and it's greater than or equal to 2.5 millimeters in amplitude. Left atrial enlargement, P wave and lead two is gonna be greater than 0.12 seconds in width. And then we have a negative, net negative biphasic P wave and V1. It goes down more than it goes up, okay? Or it goes down more than one millimeter. So those are your criteria for left atrial enlargement. That's it. Of course, you can have both. So what if I had a P wave that was greater than 2.5 millimeters in height and wider than 0.12 seconds? And then I go over to V1 and I have a bigger than normal positive deflection and also a one millimeter or more negative deflection of my P wave, as you can see here, right? Then we basically just have a combination of both things. So it's really, if you just take the criteria for a right atrial enlargement and a left atrial enlargement and apply both of them to this thing at the same exact time, then you have both, okay? That's all it is, That's it's, it's that simple, all right? So that's pretty much it for your uh, left atrial enlargement, right atrial enlargement. So go ahead and learn that criteria, okay? Because we're going to look at some EKGs and we're going to identify it. Um, it's just like anything in life, you know, uh, you got to know where to look and then you got to know what to look for. So I know in the very beginning, it's obviously impossible to just memorize things within like two seconds, um, but you're going to want to commit that to memory, okay? All right, so now let's go on to some of the more a little bit tricky stuff. So we're gonna go on to the ventricles now. <clears throat> so let's do right ventricular hypertrophy first because that's kind of the order in which path of blood flows through the heart, right? So there's a lot of different criteria out there, but really the biggest one and the most common one is gonna be this right here. Really, if you just look for one thing, you're almost always gonna be accurate. You're looking at a person who has a right axis deviation with an R wave in V1 that's greater than seven millimeters tall. So they just have some really tall R waves in V1 in the presence of a right axis deviation, okay? So that's it, that's all you really need to look for. So here's the problem. You can't reliably diagnose a right ventricular hypertrophy in the presence of a right bundle branch block because they kind of get in the way of one another, okay? So here's another thing, guys, that I, I would have liked to said earlier had I thought about it, but it just kind of came to me right now. Um, 
seeing hypertrophy on an EKG is great, fantastic. Like, oh, you have left ventricular hypertrophy, you have right ventricular hypertrophy, like that's cool. But that is not necessarily the definitive diagnosis of hypertrophy, right? So if you're gonna definitively diagnose hypertrophy, these people need an echocardiogram so they can go in there and actually do the measurements of the, the ventricle walls or the atrial walls or so on and so forth. So um, initial EKG findings, fantastic. Um, definitive diagnosis, echocardiogram. So just remember that, right? Because remember with, with EKGs, we're only looking at electricity. We're not actually looking at the physicality of things. We're just looking at electricity, right? All right, so that's it guys. Right ventricular hypertrophy, uh, pretty much seven millimeters or more in V1. That's gonna be the big one. Uh, there is another possibility and they have what's called a right ventricular strain pattern. And we haven't talked about ST changes yet because we talked about that more in, S in, uh, in the MIs, diagnosing myocardial infarctions and things. Um, but a person with a strain pattern, if you notice when this comes back up here, and then it inverts on the T wave. This J point right here, this J point where the S wave comes back up doesn't come all the way back up to the baseline. So if that J point doesn't come all the way back up to the baseline, this should come up here, right? And that's where it should end because that's my J point. That's where the S wave terminates is where the J point is. Well, what if, what if I get one of these? See that J point right there? It didn't come all the way back up to the baseline right there. So that means that we have ST, because this is the ST segment, ST segment depression, okay? And then I have a, T wave that's inverted here. So it's very common in what's called a strain pattern is that you have ST segment depression with an inverted T wave. One of my professors a long time ago used to say, it looks like a hockey stick, right? So you got these things that come here. Whenever you got hockey sticks, this little part looking like a stick of a hockey, a stick of a hockey, <laughs> the end of a hockey stick, I'm literally making up things right now. <laughs> uh, then, uh, then you probably have what's called a strain pattern, and it can be a left ventricular or right ventricular strain pattern. It could be either or. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's pretty much it. So let's just look at something real quick. So, what do we got going on here? P waves for every QRS, P say morphology. QRS is narrow and regular. It's like we got like a normal sinus rhythm, right? Okay. So remember we have rhythms and then we have things that happen to rhythms. So uh, if I was approaching this with a systematic approach, first thing I would identify is the rate. Then I would identify the rhythm and then I would look at my intervals, like the QT intervals, things like that. And then I would come over here and I would identify my axis. And then I would look for the possibility of um, bundle branch blocks, things like that. And then I'm gonna look for my hypertrophies. And that's where I am in this whole process. So when you're looking for hypertrophies, you should have done all of those things that we just talked about first, okay? So, uh, Let's just look at V1. Does this person have a right axis deviation? Yes, they do. Why do they have a right axis deviation? Because lead one is negative and AVF is positive. And if you've learned your axis deviation criteria, a negative lead one and a positive AVF is a right axis deviation. So when we have QRSs in V1, because remember with a right ventricular hypertrophy, where do we look? We look at V1. And if it's greater than seven millimeters, okay. If 
it's greater than seven millimeters tall, you've got right ventricular hypertrophy. Now, we also have something called a strain pattern here. I mean, we can already diagnose RVH from what we got, but there is more. So notice that this S wave terminates right here and it doesn't come all the way back up to the baseline. That's what we would call ST segment depression. We're gonna talk about ST segment changes like depression and elevation and stuff much, much more in depth when we get into MIs and things. But just be able to see that, just look with your eyes here. So this doesn't come all the way back up. And then you get an inverted T wave. And you kind of get this little hockey stick thing going on here, okay? So that is what we call a strain pattern, okay? And in this particular case, we have a strain pattern in the presence of a right axis deviation. We also kind of look for it in people that are greater than 35 years old too, but that's not a big, big time criteria. Um, so at the end of the day, I look at this, I go right axis deviation, V1 greater than seven millimeters in height, right ventricular hypertrophy. That's what I'm doing when I look at that. But am I doing that right away? When somebody hands me the CKG, is the, that the first thing I look at? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. First thing I'm looking at if somebody hands me the CKG is what's my rate? Then I'm looking at what's my rhythm? And then I'm looking at what are some of my intervals, like my QT interval? Do I have any prolonged intervals, right? PR interval, QT interval, things like that. And then I'm going to go look at my axis. And then I'm going to check for the presence of bundle branch blocks. And then I'm going to check for the presence of hypertrophies. And when I'm checking hypertrophies, I use a systematic approach, right? So the first thing I would do, this is just what I do. You can do whatever you want. Um, but I think, okay, let me check for hypertrophy. First thing I do is I look at lead two. Because first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my P waves in lead two. And if they're greater than 2.5 millimeters tall, I got right atrial enlargement because that's the criteria. And then I'm going to go to lead two and V1. I'm going to look at my P waves here and my P waves here. And I'm going to ask myself, okay, do I have left atrial enlargement? In this case, no, I do not. Moving on. Next thing I would do is I would look at V1. Now I've already identified the axis, right? So if I have a right axis deviation, I would look at V1. And if it's positive or negative, if it's positive, I'm looking for that right ventricular hypertrophy, it's greater than seven millimeters. Okay. And then I'm gonna look for the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy last, which we haven't talked about, we're gonna talk about right now. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. So how do I diagnose right ventricular hypertrophy? Right axis deviation, V1 greater than seven millimeters, money in the bank. Okay. Left ventricular hypertrophy is a little more tricky because you got a couple different criteria out there, but here's really what we're gonna look at, okay? Here's like the big, the big one is this. This is called the Sokolov-Leon criteria. So we're gonna look at our S waves in V1 or V2. And we're gonna look at whichever one's bigger. Some variation of the criteria only looks at V1 though. And then we're gonna look at the R wave in V5 and V6, and we're gonna look at whichever one's bigger. Okay. Let me find an EKG to highlight this. All right. So I'm going to look at V1, V2. Some people say you should only look at V1, though. So you got to remember, not all things are equally uh, agreed upon in medicine sometimes. So we're going to look at our S waves. We're going to pick whichever one's bigger. And we're going to count how many boxes it goes down. Okay, so it's hard to tell, but from here to here, let me look. That looks like 5, 10, 
13, maybe 15 or 16 boxes, probably. Let's just say 15, just to say ease of numbers, right? It's probably 15 or 16. Uh, okay, cool. Now I'm gonna go to V5 or V6, and I'm gonna look at whichever one has taller R waves. Well, in this case, it looks like this guy is a taller R wave than this guy, okay? So I'm gonna count how many boxes it goes up from the baseline. Five, 10, 15, eh, 18 maybe. Okay. Let's make sure our numbers are right. So this is really hard to see at my screen. I don't know about you guys. So that's about 16. And then this guy is Eighteen. This looks like what we got. So fifteen and fifteen is thirty plus four more. So uh, what do we got? Okay, very good. So what we're looking at here is if what we just added up our S wave in V two, our R wave in either V five or V six. If that is greater than 35 millimeters, you pretty much have uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, in this particular case, um, it doesn't doesn't quite get there, right? We're like right at that, we're like 34 millimeters, 35 millimeters, something like that. So we're like right there on the cusp of it. So this this particular EKG, uh, not maybe the perfect example of of that. I think the there are other things in this EKG that indicate left. Uh, ventricular hypertrophy, uh, but that isn't exactly the perfect example. Um, this one looks like much, much, much better of an example of that. So let's kind of do it again. So look for the S. So we're looking for just left ventricular hypertrophy right now. So look for V1, V2, look for the S waves, whichever one goes down more. It's hard to tell because this is going into the upper lead. Um, so we're going to count how many boxes it goes down. So I can't even tell what's going on here. So I'm just going to use this one. So we got five, six, seven, eight, maybe eight millimeters, something like that. Okay. Then we're going to go V5, V6 and see which one's bigger. Looks like this one's bigger. Looks like it actually ends right there. So that's like five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, plus a couple more, like 38 or something. Something like that. If that's not, perfectly accurate, then please forgive me, but I'm just doing quick math here. Uh, so what do we got? 46. So 46 millimeters is, is basically, we add them together. Okay. So you look at V1, V2, you see how many boxes the biggest S wave goes down. You look at V5, V6, you look at how many boxes the R wave, the biggest R wave goes up. You count those numbers and then you add them together. If it's greater than 35, as in millimeters, then you have a positive criteria for the Sokolaw Leon criteria. Okay. So that's the most commonly uh, used method. Why are we having these giant R waves here? Well, because a left ventricle has hypertrophied and gotten bigger. So it's using more electricity. More electricity is going to be represented as increased amplitude on an EKG. So that's pretty much what we got, okay? All right, now there's more criteria than just that. So if you have any lead that's greater than 45 millimeters by itself, we can pretty much say you have left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, another very, very commonly used one is to look at AVO, right? So the most common method, guys, is to just do the one we just did now and then combine it with AVL, okay? So 
you would look at V1, V2, S waves, how far they go down, then look at V5, V6, R waves, how far they go up, count how many boxes they do, and then add them together. If that's greater than 35 millimeters, you probably have LVH. Now, there's another thing you can look at too. You can look at AVL by itself. If AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, which it's not in this case, but let's say it went from here to here like that. And you're like, hey man, this thing is bigger than 11 millimeters. That right there is all automatic for left ventricular hypertrophy. So if the R waves and AVL are bigger than 11 millimeters, automatic for LVH, okay? So the biggest two things to kind of combine are the sokolov leon method, which we talked about, combining V1, V2, S wave depth, combining, combining V5, I'm sorry, looking at V5 or V6, R wave. Let me back up. I think I said that inappropriately. I want to make sure that I'm clear. Looking at V1 and V2 and seeing which one uh, has the greater S wave depth, counting that millimeters, then going to V5 and V6, looking at which has the greater R wave height, counting that millimeters, whatever those two numbers you come together, you, you come up with, put them together, and that is going to be uh, greater than 35 millimeters, LVH. Or you can look at ABL. If ABL is greater than 11 millimeters in height, automatically LVH. So that's pretty much it, guys. That's how you're going to diagnose LVH. Now, there's one more thing that um, is uh, prevalent in LVH, and that's called left ventricular strain or a strain pattern. So it's the kind of same thing that we talked about earlier, okay? So long, gradual, sloping ST depression with inverted T waves in your left precordial leads, okay? So if you kind of look here, see this guys, see all this stuff, right? That's common with the a strain pattern, as they say, you get a little bit of ST depression here. You get this hockey stick looking thing here, you get the inverted T wave. That's going to be the quote unquote strain pattern, right? It's basically things are just being pulled and it's skewing the electricity due to the growth of the muscle. So um, that's pretty much LVH in a nutshell. Okay. So a little confusing, definitely, but you've got to learn all the criteria first. Once you learn the criteria, then you can start go searching for things because you can't go looking for things if you don't know what you're looking for, right? So where would I? suggest being at this point, right? If I was you, I would say to myself, okay, I got to learn my criteria for left atrial, right atrial enlargement. I got to learn my criteria for right ventricular and left ventricular hypertrophy. And once I've done that and committed at the memory, now I can go looking for things. That's what I would suggest at this point. Okay. So let's, um, let's look at some practice stuff. All right, so we'll go over a couple of hypertrophies and enlargements and things like that, okay? So I realize, guys, that this is really hard to see, um, but we're gonna talk about it, work our way through it, um, and the process is the most important part of all of this, okay? So if this was an EKG, once again, the first thing I'm looking at is what's my rate? What's my rhythm, okay? If you apply all the rules that we've applied at this point, um, you'll see that this is a sinus tachycardia because it's over 100, right? Um, and then I'm gonna check my intervals, like my QT interval, things like that, and that looks okay. And then I'm going to look for my axis. So I'm going to go lead one, AVF, right? Look for my axis. Uh, let's see here. It uh, looks, looks normal. It's pretty close. 
it's hard to see if this is a net negative or if it's equiphasic, as they say. But it looks pretty much close enough, right, to be normal. Um, I don't know. It could it could be negative. It's hard to tell. Um, so either way, look for your axis. Then go check for bundle branch blocks. Okay. Um, in this particular case, you have some things that are greater than 0 0.10, less than 0.12. I'm not really particularly worried about that. Um, but let's focus on the lesson of the day, which is atrial enlargements and hypertrophy. So first thing I'm going to do now that I get to the point where I'm looking at that stuff is me, myself, I'm going to have a little system for that. So the first thing I'm going to look for is right atrial enlargement. And then I'm going to look for left atrial enlargement. And then I would look for the possibility of um, right ventricular or left ventricular uh, hypertrophy. So it just kind of is like, I train my eyes to kind of just go from left to right on the EKG because if I start here for the first thing, then I can pick up here again for the next thing and go to here. And then I can just start here again and then I can go there. It's just like following like a chronological order of, of, of progression from left to right on the paper with my eyes. That's just why I like to do it that way, okay? So let's look at lead two, P waves. So hard to see, but if I told you that this P wave was greater than 2.5 millimeters in amplitude and height, which it is, okay, that's it. What would you tell me? Hopefully, well, hopefully, you would tell me that that is a right atrial enlargement because the P wave is greater than 2.5 millimeters in height. That's it. That is really just it. And you can come over here to V1, but I'm uh, not really worried about that because I would be looking for the width of the P wave if I was concerned about left atrial enlargement. And the width is not greater than 0.12 seconds. So that is what we got. So that would be an example of a right atrial enlargement. So let's look at what we got going on here. So let's figure out the rhythm first. P waves, good. R to R intervals, good. Narrow, regular. Rate right under 100. So it looks like a normal sinus rhythm, right? Uh, at this point, guys, I'm not going to go through all the steps of identifying why that this is a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, hopefully we can kind of be able to figure that out by now. Uh, then I'm going to look at my axis. So it looks like I have a right axis deviation because lead one is negative and AVF is positive. So we got right axis deviation, right? And then I'm gonna come over here and look for my hypertrophy stuff. So I got P waves and lead two that are greater than 2.5 millimeters. So that tells me I have right atrial enlargement, but they're not greater in width than 0.12 seconds. So I do not have left atrial enlargement, okay? Then I'm going to look for my hypertrophy stuff. So I'm going to come over here, look at this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. Okay. So remember what we said. If you've got a right axis deviation, right, and you've got some V1 R waves greater than seven millimeters, you're going to have right ventricular hypertrophy. So don't get confused. Some of you are probably looking at this and going, what the heck is going on? You're going to get confused here because this is your P wave and this is actually your R wave, right? It's hard to tell at first. And it looks weird because your P wave is almost as high as the R wave. Okay. <laughs> so it looks a little, a little crazy here, but that's your P wave and that's your R wave. Okay, so in this particular case, got a right axis deviation, R waves greater than seven millimeters. 
we got right ventricular hypertrophy also. Okay. So got a normal sinus rhythm with right atrial enlargement. Why do we have right atrial enlargement? Because lead two P waves are greater than 2.5 millimeters in height. And then we also got right ventricular hypertrophy. Why? Because we have a right axis deviation and we got R waves greater than seven millimeters in height in V1. Okay, so that's why we got that. All right, so what do we got rhythm wise? We got a normal sinus rhythm, okay. We're gonna look at our axis. So we've got a left axis deviation. So remember when I told you we have a left axis deviation or a right bundle branch block, always go to lead two right away. And if lead two is negative, then you're also gonna have a left anterior fascicular block, right? Okay. Then I'm gonna look, now that I've decided my axis, and if appropriate, check lead two. Then I'm gonna move on to my hypertrophy stuff. So first thing I'm gonna look at or look for is my right atrial enlargement. So I'm gonna to go to lead two, look at my P waves. And if they're greater than 2.5 millimeters in height, I've got right atrial enlargement, right? Are they wider than 0.12 seconds? No, they're not. So I don't have left atrial enlargement. I definitely don't have uh, right uh, ventricular hypertrophy. And let's kind of just look here, see what we come up with. So that's five, that's eight, plus a couple more, maybe 10 or 11. So that's borderline. So if AVL was higher than 11 millimeters, we would say we automatically have left ventricular hypertrophy. Let's Take a quicker, closer look. Five, nine, that's like 11. That might even be 12. So that's like borderline to whether this person has left ventricular hypertrophy based on AVL. Or we could do the Sokolov Leon, come here, V1, V2. Which one goes down more? This goes down about eh, five boxes. And go to V5, V6. Look at which one goes up more. Count how many boxes. So 5, 10, 12, maybe 14, maybe. Maybe 16 boxes, something like that. So either way, it's not more than 35 millimeters. If, if those numbers that we came up to were greater than 35 millimeters, we would say this person has LVH, okay? So LVH, borderline based on ABL, but not definitive, uh, but definitely right atrial enlargement because that P waves greater than 2.5 millimeters in height. And going back to the earlier lecture, left axis deviation. And if you have a left axis deviation, you got to go to lead two. If lead two is more negative than positive, you got a left anterior fascicular block also. All right, same thing guys, normal sinus rhythm. Oh, sorry, just kidding, sinus tachycardia, it's a little too fast for that. P waves, greater than 2.5 millimeters. You gotta use that 2.5 instead of three. If you use that three, you're gonna miss some. So this would be sinus tach, right atrial enlargement, right? Why? That's why. 2.5 millimeters in height lead to P waves. What if they were greater than 0.12 seconds? Then we start getting into the presence of left atrial enlargement. And then we would look at V1 because right atrial enlargement, I only care about lead two. Left atrial enlargement, I care about lead two and V1. Okay. If 
feel like we already looked at this. So either way, normal sinus rhythm, right atrial enlargement. Right axis deviation. V1 has R waves of positive deflection greater than seven millimeters in the presence of a right axis deviation. So it looks like we also have right ventricular hypertrophy. So like, why do we have all of that stuff? Well, it's just the criteria, guys. The criteria for right atrial enlargement, P wave greater than 2.5 millimeters in height. Criteria for right ventricular hypertrophy is a R wave greater than seven millimeters in the presence of a right axis deviation. And we have a, why do we have a right axis deviation? Because AVF is positive and lead one is negative. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. There we go, okay. Finally, change. Okay. So this is hard to see, I know, but sinus tack is the rhythm. Okay. Axis. Oh, man. There we go. Oh, my goodness. Come on, Penn. Why have you forsaken me? There we go. So lead one AVF looks like we got a left axis deviation, right? Okay, and then we're gonna look at our hypertrophy stuff. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at lead two P waves. Hey man, you got some big old P waves, man. Okay. And then I'm gonna come over here V1. Notice V1, what we got going on here? We've got a P wave that goes up a little bit, but it goes down way more than it goes up. So we got a net negative deflection on V1 P wave. So if you go back to your criteria and you say, hey, P wave greater than 0.12 seconds in duration, P waves in V1 over here, net negative deflection on a biphasic P wave, net negative, it's more negative than positive. That's your criteria for left atrial enlargement, okay? So this guy has some left atrial enlargement going on. Well, this is just getting a little ugly, right? So let's do one thing at a time. Normal sinus rhythm, right? You got P waves. So we got some P waves. Okay, P waves have the same morphology, PR interval is okay, QRS is wide, I don't like that, R to R is regular, rates under 100, so this has all the criteria of a sinus rhythm, the only abnormality we see off the bat is we got a wide QRS, so if I have a wide QRS and I have P waves, I'm going to go to V1, and I can say, does it go down or up? And it goes down. Then we go to lead one, R wave only, V6, R wave only. So I have a left bundle branch block criteria. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna move on. Oh, I forgot to do my axis, sorry. So lead one, AVF, lead one goes up, AVF goes down. We have a left axis deviation, a left bundle branch block. And then I'm gonna come over here Look at my P waves. I got wide P waves greater than 0.12 seconds. Then I go to V1 P waves more negative than positive. So net negative deflection 
a biphasic P wave. So what you're seeing in this guy is a normal sinus rhythm with the left bundle branch block, a left axis deviation. And then because we have P waves that are wide and lead to and negative and V1, we have left atrial enlargement, okay? So this is kind of cool. We got some stuff going on here. So we got a normal sign. Well, we got a sinus rhythm, but we got a little PVC going on right here. So that's interesting, right? So we got a sinus rhythm with a PVC. And did my rate, did my rhythm, check my intervals, check my axis. Axis is going to be what? Positive, negative. That's going to be a left axis deviation. Then, if you looked at your QRS width, you notice you got some wide QRSs. So, does V1 go down or up? It goes down. Lead one and V6 are waves only. So, that meets our criteria for a left bundle branch block. So yeah, if you look here from here to here, that PR interval looks like it's about 0.22 seconds, something like that, 0.24. So it actually looks like your PR interval is a little bit prolonged. If you have a prolonged PR interval, you also have a first degree AV block, right? And it's really hard to see, but let's look at our atria and our ventricles for hypertrophy now. So in lead two, where we start for all of that, we have this M-shaped P wave. And an M-shaped P wave, P mitral pattern, as they say, is associated with a left atrial enlargement. So then I'm going to come over here to V1 to confirm, and my P wave goes down more than it goes up. So it looks like we have a left atrial enlargement, okay? So it's got a lot of stuff going on with this guy. It's got some things. So why is it left atrial enlargement? M-shaped P wave lead to greater than 0.12 seconds duration, net negative V1 P wave. All right. So what do we got? Normal sinus rhythm. Why is it a normal sinus rhythm? P waves are present and upright. P for every QRS. Same morphology. PR intervals are within normal limits. My QRS is narrow. My R to R is regular. My axis My axis is the left axis deviation. And I look for my hypertrophies. There's no blocks, so I don't need to do that. But I look for my hypertrophies. That's okay. That's fine. But we got some big old giant R waves, man. Big old R waves, man. So I'm going to look at V1, V2, S wave, which one goes down more? So we could say count it. So 5, 10, maybe 14 boxes. Look at V5, it goes from about here to about here. So that's 5, 10, 15, 17 boxes, maybe. I don't know, something like that. So that is not greater than 35, right? Because that's what we're looking for. But wait a minute. What do we got going on here in AVL? 
remember we got to check AVL for left ventricular hypertrophy too. So if AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, so let's look. So 5, 10, 12, maybe 14, 15 millimeters, something like that. So that right here is indicative of left ventricular hypertrophy, right? Because even though it doesn't meet the criteria on the V1, V2, V5, V6 thing, it meets the criteria on the AVL thing, and that's enough. You just need one or the other. You don't need both. So this one's a little sneaky. This is why people who only use one set of criteria can miss things. So that's why we combine a couple of things because it casts a wider net and it increases the sensitivity of identifying for the presence of a left ventricular hypertrophy, right? Okay, so why is it LVH? AVL greater than 11 millimeters. That's why. Got to learn them criteria if you don't know them. No other way around it. And if you're watching this for the first time and you don't know the criteria yet, that's okay too. I'm not harping on you. Just reminding that, you know, it's just something that eventually you got to get down. All right, so what do we got? Normal sinus rhythm. P waves are kind of wide over here and they go down more than they go up over here. So it looks like a left atrial enlargement. Look at V1, V2, S waves, hard to see, V5, V6, S waves. So count how far down that goes, count how far up that goes, however many small boxes it is, add that number together. If it's greater than 35 millimeters, which I promise it is, that is diagnostic for left ventricular hypertrophy, okay? So same thing here. I'm just gonna pull out what we need to take out of this here. So this goes down about what? Two or three plus five plus five plus five. So we're looking at maybe 18 or so right there. Then we got what? 5, 10, 15, 20, 22, 25. So like 25 plus 15 or something like that. So whatever it is, um, it's definitely more than 35 millimeters. Okay. So this would be normal sinus rhythm. Um, but why do we have, um, why do we have LVH? because V1, V2, um, S wave goes, we count whichever one goes down more, V5, V6, count R wave, whichever one goes up more. And uh, we just add them together. If it's greater than 35 millimeters, then we got LVH. And same thing here. This one's a little bit, a little bit different though. So this is an, another good example, right? So normal sinus rhythm, right? And I'm just looking for LVH right now. Well, that is definitely not going to meet my criteria for being greater than 35 millimeters. But what do I also got to check? I can't just check V1, V2, V5, V6 when I'm looking for LVH. I also got to check AVL. If AVL is greater than 11 millimeters, which it definitely is in this case, 5, 10, 15, 17, whatever boxes, that is enough by itself to diagnose LVH. So if I'm looking for LVH in summary, look at V1, V2, V5, V6, and also AVL, okay? So, That's what I'm looking at. Asking myself, does it go more than 35 millimeters? 
but I also have this strain pattern or hockey stick kind of appearance, right? Okay. So because we have that strain pattern and because we have greater than 35 millimeters, we would have LVH. And then last but not least, same thing going on here. So be a normal sinus rhythm. It's gonna have LVH. Why is it gonna have LVH? Five, oops. So five, 10, 15 plus two here is maybe like 17. And then plus five, 10, 15, 18 plus three more is like 21. So that comes up to more than 35 millimeters, right? So how did I get that? I looked at V1, V2, looked at which one went down more, looked at V5, V6, looked at which one went up more, counted the amount of boxes. The first one went down, counted the amount of boxes. The second one went up, add them together, greater than 35 millimeters, you got LVH. Also, AVL looks good, so I don't need to worry about that. And I got a little bit of a strain pattern here, as they call it. It's got that little hockey stick looking appearance, okay? So that's just a little bit of practice for right now. So um, that's pretty much hypertrophy in a nutshell. So why do we have hypertrophy? Because for whatever reason, um, the ventricle or the atriums are expanding and enlarging, okay? And that can be problematic from a physiologic or a pathophysiologic standpoint, all right? So the next thing is to how do we identify them? Remember, we can identify them on the EKG with increased amplitudes, um, but definitive diagnosis is gonna be an echocardiogram. So always keep that in mind, right? Um, and then we need to know our criteria for our right atrial, left atrial enlargement, and then our criteria for left ventricular, right ventricular hypertrophy. And once you get those criteria down pat, you can start going on the hunt for them and looking at them for uh, presence of those things on your EKG. So uh, last but not least, a systematic approach, guys. When you're approaching EKGs, you're probably noticing by now that a lot of things build on one another, okay? This is all just like building a house, we got to lay one brick at a time, okay? So when I get an EKG, the first thing I'm looking at is what's my rate, then I'm looking at what's my rhythm, right? And then I'm going to look at maybe my QT intervals, make sure things like that are not abnormal. And then I'm going to go look at my axis. And then I'm going to check for the possibility of bundle branch blocks. And then I'm going to check for the possibility of hypertrophies and enlargements. So that's the order of things in which I'm training my mind to process all of this. And then the next step that we're going to get into uh, in the next lecture is going to be looking for ischemia or ischemic changes. So diagnosing the, the presence of myocardial infarctions and um, things of that nature. Okay, so that's the stepwise approach um, that I take when approaching an EKG, um, and I would encourage you to do something in a similar fashion, but always have a systematic approach. That's my best advice I can give you. So hopefully this was helpful to you guys. Uh, and if not, listen, I don't have an ego. I'm like a humble person, and I always try to get better at life. And if you think that you've got life figured out, then life has a way of humbling you. That's all I can say. So if, for whatever reason, guys, you feel like there's something that we talked about today uh, that wasn't explained clearly, or I could do a better job of explaining, by all means, let me know, right? Uh, because I'm always seeking to improve myself as well, uh, as everyone should. So if you have any feedback, negative or positive, by all means, reach out, let us know. Uh, we're always open to any constructive criticisms. So um, study, and um, we will see you again.